the minds be acceptable to you, the Lord of our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I almost want to tell you to come back up and read that again. How many of you heard what I said at the end of it? Right? She said the word of the Lord, and then we responded. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Really? Did you hear what Kelly read? <laughs> and are you thankful for it? No. <laughs> no, right? If, if, if we had a gospel affirmation, it would be the gospel of our Lord. Um, praise to you, O Christ, right? And it's just like, really? These are not the words that we want to hear. This is, had I known and looked ahead, this would have been a Sunday I would have asked for vacation. <laughs> Right? Who wants to hear about this story, really? But when I when I listened to the podcast and I read the stuff this past week about what the, what's going on in this text, the, the three professors at Luther Seminary that helped put together the, the lectionary, the narrative lectionary that we follow said, you know, this isn't the feel-good lectionary. It's the narrative lectionary. It tells the story of what happened in the, in the Bible and our story, and we can't just skip over the stories that we don't want to talk about. So we have to read this story. And Jesus says that the kingdom of God can be compared to a king who threw a banquet. And he sent his slaves out and said, come to the banquet. And nobody came. Now, would you turn down an invitation to come to a banquet for the king? Bless you. Probably not. Because it's probably going to be better food than you have, right? Number one, you know, the king's given it, so the king can get whatever he wants. So it's probably going to be a really good banquet. And it's not just like, you know, our, our fellowship hour where there's, you know, donuts and cheese and, and baked goods and maybe some sausage, maybe some cheese, thing on a month, maybe some devil eggs. <laughs> maybe we've had a lot of egg salad lately, too, that would be right? But it's nothing like that, right? Because it says after the, the slaves came back and nobody came, the, the king sent out more slaves. And he said, go and tell them that my... Oxen, oxen, right, which is plural, that's more than one, right, for those of you that are a little bit slow at math. Oxen means that that's two or more oxen that he has killed, and my fatted calves, plural, right? So he's killed at least two oxen and at least two fatted calves, probably way more than that, for this banquet. And these slaves go out and they tell people, and what happens? They say, I don't have time for that. They maltreated the, the slaves, as said in our reading this morning. That's a wonderful word, isn't it? Maltreated? Yes. Maltreated. They didn't treat them very well. And then some of them actually beat and killed, killed the slaves that went out. So here's our first overreaction, right? The slaves are killed. All they were doing was inviting these people to come to a dinner. Doesn't that seem a little bit over the top? Well, then the king responds in love, right? <laughs> the king responds with, well, you didn't like my grace. You didn't like what I was going to give you, so fine, I'll just take care of you. And he sends out his troops, and he kills everybody, and he burns their town. And then he responds in love, actually. This is where it starts to get at least a little bit of the, the, the gospel, the, the good news that we're supposed to share, right? The king sends out more slaves, and he sends them out into the city streets, and he says, find everyone and bring them in. The good, the bad, the indifferent, just find them and fill up the hall. And the slaves went out, and they says that they found all of these people, the good, the bad, and they invited them all in, and everybody came in, and the wedding hall was full. And everybody was welcome. All right, let's stop the reading right there. And we're not going to go on. Right, that's verse 10. Everyone was welcome, and everything is great. But they didn't stop there. And the story doesn't stop there. And the king comes into the banquet, and he sees all these people sitting there in, his, in their beautiful wedding robes, right? Because you're supposed to wear nice clothes when you go to, when you go to the wedding banquet, right? You're supposed to wear nice clothes when you come to worship. It's all about the way that you dress. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we were in confirmation class for a minute here. It was slow to get the answer to out. Right? It's a 
shots fired. He sees all these people sitting in these immaculate wedding robes, and there's one person who's not wearing a wedding garment. He comes up to him, and what does he say? No. What did he say? What's friend. the very first word that the friend. king says to this man? Friend. 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 That's not something you say to someone that you're mad at, really. I mean, maybe. That's not the way that he would start this if he was going to really give this guy a hard time because he wasn't wearing a wedding garment. He says to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment on? Kind of like, you know, how did this happen? What's going on here? Because then we have to look and figure out why the parable fails us, right? Because where do these wedding garments come from? Maybe. The king might be the one who provides them for them. Because here's the thing, right? The slaves just went out into the city streets and they gathered everybody, the good, the bad, whoever, right? All of you were out in the streets and the servants went out and said, come for the banquet is ready and you come waltzing in. Did you have time to go home to get your wedding garment? No. And what were wedding garments? And this is a bunch, there's a bunch of different things about this. So what I'm telling you is one idea that, that people think is the possibility of the way things work. It's the one idea that I like to think is the, is the way that it worked. Because it says a lot for when, once we get to the end. Right? Wedding garments were, were things that you had. They were nicer clothes. They were robes that you would wear to a normal person's wedding to show your status. Right? Kind of like wearing a designer-made suit versus one off the shelf at JCPenney's. Right? You can tell the difference between a guy who's dressed in the suit that's been well tailored for him and the guy that just went to the whatever store and bought the size, you know, 38 off the shelf, right? There's something special about that. And that's what these wedding robes were. They were garments that you had that set you apart and showed your status. But when you went to a royal wedding, the king would provide the wedding robes. Why? Because the king didn't want to be upstaged. He should have the best robes, right? So no one else should show up in a robe that's better than the king. So the king would give you a robe. So what happened here when this guy is sitting without the wedding garments on, he is either one of the people that was originally invited and survived the mayhem that the king put on his town and showed back up. Because the king would have sent the robes to them before, right? So they could come with them. Or, he snuck in. I mean, he didn't go through the main gate. Because at the main gate, they were passing out wedding robes. So the king comes to him and he says, Friend, how is it that you're here without the proper clothing on? And what does the guy say? Nothing. Nothing. He doesn't give any defense. He doesn't say, well, I came through the main gate and they were out of my size, so I couldn't, you know. The next one up, I was swimming. And the, the one smaller, I just, there's no way it was going on me, right? Or I came in over the gate because I didn't want to stand in line. He said nothing. He didn't, he didn't comment about how he got in without, without having the robe on. He didn't say anything to the king. And at that point, the king gets upset. Right? Because everybody was invited in. Everybody is welcome. But once you come and accept the invitation to the banquet, then you, there's other steps that have to happen as well. Right? It's not about what we do to get invited to the banquet. It's about once, what we do once we accept that invitation. Right? Because many... That last verse, many are called, but few are chosen. Everyone's welcome. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is chosen. That's a hard thing to say, actually. But everyone is chosen by God to be his child and to do what he calls us to do. And every last one of us is welcome and called to come to the banquet. But it's about more than coming. About more than showing up. It's about understanding whose we are and who we are and what has happened by that invitation of getting called to come to the banquet, right? It's about understanding that once we come in, 
that we're now just not that person out in the streets anymore, that we now have accepted God's grace, and that God's grace should cover us, and that in that happening, we're wearing something different, and we're someone different, and our lives show that to the world. Right? It's not just about us being the same person we were, because once we accepted that invitation to come to the banquet, we were changed. And God gave us that garment. And where did we get that garment? Back there. I hear it. Everybody say it louder. Baptism. Right? When you were baptized, that's why when you're... When, in, Sometimes in baptism ceremonies, the, the kids will come wearing those nice white dresses, right? Mm -hmm. Or the nice white suits, right? Or in, if you've ever gone to a Catholic baptism, sometimes the, the garment gets put on during the baptism. Because um, it's about you being clothed in Christ. It's the same reason why we have a white pall. A pall is a, is a big piece of fabric that covers a, covers a coffin. So when a person passes away and their, their body comes into the sanctuary for the sermon, for the service, they're covered in a white piece of fabric. Why? Because it's not them that we're seeing, it's Christ. It's all about being clothed in Christ and understanding that we're not ourselves, that we are God's, and that he has called us and claimed us, and he expects us to do the things that he's called and led us to do. So showing up to to just be a part of something is not enough. You actually have to live your life in a way that shows forth God and Christ's love to the world. That's what this parable is about. And it's a little bit straightforward in your face because that's the way Matthew likes to do it. He doesn't hold any punches. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't make it a pasty, pastel kind of thing to make everything pretty. He puts it right up here in your face and says, this is the way God is going to do it because that's the way God is. God, the, the king didn't get upset with the man until he didn't do what? Repent or tell God why he was there without what he didn't have. And I wonder what would have happened. Right? The king says, friend, how did you get in here without having the proper robes on? And the guy says, they didn't have my size at the gate. And the guy goes, well, okay, I think we've got more. Come with me and let me see if we can't get you worked out. It's all about our attitude and understanding what God has already done for us and knowing how much further God is willing to go to keep us. So remember that everyone is invited and you're asked to put on your wedding gown, not so that you can't see who you are, but so that the world sees God through you. So share that love that you've been given and make sure that everyone knows that they're also because that's what God wants us to do.